Hi, this is Maggie. In this video, we're going to talk about two kinds of UML diagrams, class diagrams and object diagrams. UML is short for Unified Modeling Language, and it provides a standard for modeling object-oriented systems. Each kind of diagram documents an aspect of a software system. The diagrams can be used during design and also as a form of documentation in both cases for communicating about how the system is structured and behaves. A diagram can be a blueprint for developing a system, and it can also help you understand how a system functions. Diagrams are an abstraction. They will show detail about some aspects of a system while ignoring others. This helps us focus on one aspect of a system at a time. We'll begin with class diagrams, as they are an abstraction of the static structure of an object-oriented system. Here we have the code for the class shopping list. We'll draw a UML class diagram of this class. The class diagram has four parts, the name of the class, the fields, the methods, and the responsibilities. Any part of the diagram can be optional and can be shown at different levels of detail depending on where you are in the design process and how the diagram is being used. For a completed system that is being documented with class diagrams for future software engineers maintaining the software, a more complete diagram is preferable. As you're developing a system, you might begin with just the responsibilities of a class and later, as you work out details, start to describe the public interface and finally the implementation details. This class has already been written, so we'll write a complete diagram. I'm just going to use Microsoft Word and create a table with four rows and one column. In the first row, I'll put the name of the class centered, and that's shopping list. The fields go in the second row. The standard format is one field per line, and for each field, visibility indicator, name, colon, type. We have two fields, both private. More on the visibility in a minute, but for now, we indicate private visibility with a dash. So dash items colon list dash all items colon list. Now that's it for fields. So we move on to the next box, which is methods. These are listed as visibility indicator, name, and then parameter list, which is each parameter with its type separated by commas. And then colon return type. You can omit the return type if there isn't any value returned. Because we're not responsible for passing self into our methods, I don't show self in the parameter list. If we were translating this diagram to a different language, such as Java, we wouldn't pass self in. Since the diagrams could be language agnostic, I'm not going to show this Python-specific parameter. So, plus sign for public visibility, init, and then the parameter list, and there are no parameters for init, and no return value, so that's it for that method. Then on the next line, plus sign add item, and then item of type string, and it has no return value, so that's it. Then on the next line, plus sign remove item, item of type string, 
no return value. And then get list, no parameter. Return value of type list. And get all items. No parameter. Return value of type list. Now the last section is for responsibilities. And I find this most useful before I'm finished designing a system, when I'm working out what the various objects will be responsible for doing. And this is just natural language. Let's say maintaining a shopping list, maintaining a list of all items, um, oops, ever placed on the list, adding an item to the shopping list, removing an item from the shopping list. And that's it. That's a class diagram for the shopping list class. Now, what do private and public mean? Private means that the field or method is part of the object's implementation that is subject to change. It therefore should not be used by any part of the software system outside of the object's own methods. Public means that the field or method is part of the object's public interface, meaning that it will not change and can be freely used by parts of the system outside of the object's methods. From a design standpoint, we want to keep implementation details private if they might change in future versions of the object. If there's no good reason for the outside system to see the implementation details, make them private. We also want to keep the implementation private if we would like it to be modified only in well-defined ways through the methods of the object. And so we don't want the possibility of an outside part of the system having access and potentially corrupting the data. As a rule of thumb, until you have a better sense of how these design decisions are made, your fields should all be private and your methods should all be public. An exception might be a helper method that is used by one or more of your methods, but that you don't expect any outside part of the system to ever use. You might make such a helper method private. Now let's talk about an object diagram. An object diagram offers a dynamic picture of the system. It shows what values are in the fields of an object at a particular point during program execution. So, for example, we have this program make list, and it might be interesting to do an object diagram of the shopping list object my list after we add milk, bread, and peanut butter. It's going to be similar to the class diagram but we show only the name and the fields, and we show the name of the object in the top row and the values of the fields, not the types, in the second row. So, I'll write in the top row, my list colon shopping list. This object diagram shows the specific object, my list. Now for each of the two fields, I put an equal sign after the name, not a colon. And when the object is first initialized, both of these fields are the empty list. Why don't I label that and leave it 
and we'll make another diagram. I'll copy paste it. Okay, so after we add the three items, both sets of three are in both lists. So the field items is the list of three strings, milk, bread, and peanut butter. And so is the list of all items. Let's do one more. What does our object look like at the end of the program? We've added and or removed and added bread. So the regular list and the all items list both still contain bread. but then we remove milk. That will be removed from the regular list, but it will still be part of all items because that will always hold every item we ever put on the list. So this documents how this object state should be transformed by this program. It is how the object should behave and what we expect. It might be useful for clarifying requirements, and it could help us in the debugger if we examined the object and found it didn't match our expectations. To practice with this, I recommend you draw a class diagram for another class and then draw some object diagrams for the object in different states during program execution. There is good documentation for UML at IBM, so you can reference this documentation if you have questions. When you can write several class diagrams, and you can write object diagrams for an object at different points during program execution, and those match what you see in the debugger, you're ready to move on.